now, coming to you live from Huntsville Attic Studio, it's the Smile World Show. And here's your host, John Heathertime Holds You. Welcome to the new Smile World Show. I'm your host, John Holshue, coming live from the Huntsville Attic. I want to thank the Anchor Thieves for the opening theme. Uh, and tonight, uh, with me as always, is the awesome Robbie Billups. Oh, thank you. Awesome. The awesome Robbie Billups. I like that. The indestructible James Lineback. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here again. And our thespian friend, Justin Goldsmith, who recently seen on Nashville. And, of course, he was on another episode of Nashville. And if he, and he was on Nashville as well, I believe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You might even see me on this episode I'm on next. <laughs> mm. Nice resume. Mm. Yeah. I like it. Tonight, we're actually talking about science fiction. Science fiction. Ooh. Something near and dear to our hearts. We all love science fiction. A topic we've been excited to do. Uh, something to start the new season of Smile on Ours. Uh, Smile or ours. Smile or ours. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, so it was a topic we're excited about. <laughs> so it's good to have you here. So uh, this is a new host jitters, folks. So I, uh, I appreciate hanging out. So if you haven't tuned out yet, uh, we're going to start off with uh, what makes great, great sci-fi. To you guys, um, since this is sci-fi, we're going to be talking about film, we're talking about books, we're going to talk about sci-fi in general. But uh, let's go with what makes great sci-fi. I want to start with uh, James. Well, I mean, the first obvious thing is to make great, great sci-fi are the basic elements, you know. Either high technology or new discovery. <laughs> what was that funny for? <laughs> I was thinking of the arse still. <laughs> James is trying to be serious. It's nothing to do with James. He's making valid points. Go ahead, James. <laughs> James? <laughs> so, yeah, of course, for the, some of the first things great science fiction has to have are the basic elements. You know, new, new discovery, <laughs> um, advanced technology, that kind of stuff, and then, uh, you know, the interaction of how that affects humans. Goldsmith? Your, uh, your, what your opinion? What makes great sci-fi to you? Well, for me, John, it's all about possibilities and where science can take us in the future or the very distant past in another place that's not here. All you know, right. For example, the warp drive and pretty much every other piece <coughs> of technology from Star Trek. Yeah, that is coming true yeah. even today. I mean, cell phones. Those Someday, everybody will have cell phones, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> One day. <laughs> What about you, Robin Billups? Well, <clears throat> the science fiction movies can be a whole lot of things. They can be action movies. They can be adventure movies. They can be horror movies. movies they can be fantasy movies. They can be dramas. They can be serious. They can be funny. Uh, so all that stuff aside, like special effects are always cool in a cool sci-fi movie. I really like the crazy concepts, basically what you guys were hitting on. I like the cerebral stuff. A good example of that is the movie Solaris. I like that we can question things about humanity through science fiction. But what I like best about science fiction, like in movies and books and comics and all that stuff, are, are the crazy-ass concepts, time travel, uh, cloning and eugenics, extra dimensions and crazy future technology. The future. We can project into the future what can possibly happen. And uh, I'm more... I really like the uh, where you can go with your story when you introduce these crazy ass concepts. Possibilities, all the what ifs. Possibilities. I all guess that's a quicker ifs. way to say. It. <clears throat> I pretty much agree with you guys. I like when it comes to special effects. Obviously, films. I want my mind blown. I want special effects I haven't seen before. I like the concepts. I want new concepts. I want something that uh, opens my mind, especially done with science. I've, I mean, I've gone to films too when you're going in to see. Oh, I saw that trailer. It looks interesting, and then something completely different, and you're not expecting. Especially a uh, a horror film. Look at Alien, for example, which is a sci-fi horror film. I like that whole idea. That blows my mind. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's one of the cool things about sci-fi is that it can pretty much be anything. Like going back to Star Trek again, the series, it's pretty much a different show every time you look at it. Yeah, they can cross genres. Yeah. Mix genres. The Doc genres. Doctor shows, <laughs> western. It's all. Yes. All these different things. All never underestimate the sci-fi western, my friend. Yep. Westworld? Mm -hmm. I was going to bring it. Westworld's the only one I can think of. <laughs> well, um, 
Bruce, uh, Cowboy Briscoe, Bebop. Briscoe County Jr. Outlaw Star. Briscoe County Jr. Serenity, Fire. Uh, wild, yeah. wild West. Wild, Wild uh. West. <laughs> wild, Wild West. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a Western sci-fi. The TV show. Oh, okay. I just oh. automatically <laughs> think of the Will Smith. Oh, whoa. <laughs> I try to forget the giant metal spider. What movie? I mean, what's But what if, <laughs> James? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, also another great thing is about sci-fi. Uh, we can't forget robots. 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 Future technology yeah. and possibilities. Hmm. What if? Robots. They should do a comic series called What If. What would be a great name for a comic series. Oh, yeah, it would. (laughs) And, uh, okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Jason Huff. And I'm Alex Gibson. And we're with Blogman Media. We wanted to take a minute to reach out through the Rock and Robbie podcast to fill you guys in a little bit about our Kickstarter campaign we currently have up uh, for our film Snow. You can go to our website, theblogman.com slash blogman dash media to learn a little bit more about it. Yeah, right now we have uh, Stefano Danielson is our current lead for Snow. And uh, we have Ellie Collins, who is from, uh, is a local. It's in Atlanta right now filming CW with the originals. Yeah, we've got some pretty cool cast and crew, uh, including Matt Silva, who was a makeup artist on The Walking Dead, as well as uh, for Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 and the Three Stooges movie. Yeah, take a moment to uh, check the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, make sure you click that green Back to Project button and uh, see what kind of rewards that we have out there for you guys. Yeah, please come and check that out and check out the website too. And we thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Welcome back, you R spaces. <laughs> so, no, seriously though, welcome back to the Huntsville Attic, uh, Smile at All Show. Again, we're talking about science fiction. We're talking about favorite science fiction films. Actually, I was looking through popular science fiction films, beloved by everybody, and Popular Mechanics actually had a list of top 100. Holy shit, 100 films. That's a lot of films. Yeah, man. but yeah. surprisingly, the top two, I think a lot of people would agree with, would be in their top, I would say even their five. <coughs> their number two, they listed as Blade Runner, and the number one they listed is 2001, A Space Odyssey. Interesting. Yeah, maybe you guys agree, maybe mm. you don't agree, disag- yeah. you disagree, I mean, those are don't. both really good movies. Both phenomenal films can't argue with there. It's hard to pick a top five or even a top ten, yeah, but no if you're put on the spot, what would you pick? Justin Goldsmith. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I made I put them in order, but I don't know if this is the true order, because, you know, I love sci-fi so much, I just kind of picked five of my favorites. I have a feeling Star Trek's going to be in there, but go ahead. Well, number five, I put Blade Runner. It's because it's great. Okay. Number four, I've got Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Wrath of Khan. 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 Number three, I've got Star Trek First Contact. That is so, my yeah. favorite Star Trek movie, is First Contact. Number two, I don't think any of you guys are going to have this on your list. Sunshine. Great film. Really? really? Um, great I film. I love Sunshine. The, just, That's interesting. It's, okay. It's an experience. I think it's a good hmm. film. I think it keeps you end, warm. It's oh, the movie. I think, <laughs> I think at the end it turns a little bit just into uh, a slasher movie, but yeah, it has it's, some it's slasher solid. aspects it's not at one bad. point. It's not bad. <laughs> uh, but the music, every, the whole thing as an experience, is just amazing. Especially when they're just like looking at the sun. There's no sound at all except what's oh, great cast too. Yeah. Chris Evans is good, excellent in that movie. And yeah. Killian Murphy. Killian Murphy. Oh yeah, yeah. and then the. Uh, Michelle Yeoh from uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. Tomorrow Never Dies. Thank and you, Cheryl Crow. My number one, I put Event Horizon. You can't Ooh. leave. <coughs> she won't let you. Wow. The Event Horizon. Yeah. She's coming back. I love... Man, that movie is... No matter how many times I watch it, it still creeps me out. Yeah. Especially That's when Sam Neill... Yeah. Sam Neill... Dr. Grant's got the face and eyes all messed up and jabbed out and stuff. 
Yeah. Is his name actually Look. Dr. Grant, or is that his name in Jurassic Park? That's in Jurassic Park. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't remember his name in the movie, actually. It's what Dr. About, something. I think it was Sam Neill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he just played himself. In every movie. The best part of that is when he finds those raptors. Oh, I get that confused <laughs> with every. Uh, what about you, uh, James? What would you consider your top five? Top five. Well, I'll start off a little bit different. Uh, Starship Troopers. Starship. That was close on mine too. I love that. Yeah. <clears throat> Both a book and a uh, movie. And then I'm gonna go the Last Starfighter just because it's crazy nostalgic. For Classic me. for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, love Last Starfighter. And then I'm gonna start getting heavy here. With okay. Blade oh. Runner. Okay. Nice. All nice. Right. Alien. So far, all comedies. <laughs> <laughs> And Metropolis. 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 Yes. Uh, James what brings out the silent film. Yeah. That's a great movie, though. The design Classic. in that Classic. movie. Classic. Beautiful. Well, design. and, I mean, it. Not to be confused with Metropolis, the anime, correct? Yes, Metropolis, correct. the original sci- the or the silent city. film back in the. Oh, yeah. yeah the city. Because it has a lot of the same themes that Blade Runner has, with the working class being, you know, sent yeah. to the pits, kind of, <laughs> at the very bottom of the city. and super rich living way up the top completely not connected to you know the rest of the world i see that theme actually in a lot of sci-fi movies now or sci-fi mm-hmm. books and i think a lot of it started with metropolis it was either inspired by maybe coincidental but uh, you do see that theme run a lot a lot of sci-fi lots of designs of uh robots and technology in general comes from that movie too like just the the colors and the the way they the robots look the cyborgs and you know what i'm talking about like if you look at a random robot, like if you Google robot, I'm sure that the top ten will all look like or be from I would Metropolis. assume if you just Google robot, you'd come back a lot of searches. Would come <laughs> back. Yes. A lot of just information <laughs> would yeah. come back. But I bet it would look like it came from Metropolis. What about you, uh, Robbie? Well, top five is really hard. You know, I want to get one in there outside top five. Donnie Darko. <coughs> Donnie can't, Darko's can't argue with film. you there. All right, number five. And coincidentally... All of my top five have Keanu Reeves in them. Oh. <clears throat> Number five is The Matrix. Yeah. Mm. Now, forget what whatever you think about part two or three or anything else. Remember the first time you watched that movie. It blew your mind, yeah. dude. It just knocked it out of the park. Uh, number four, Day the Earth Stood Still, except for I'm talking about the original one, not the mm. one with Keanu Reeves. But you said they all had Keanu in them. Anyway. You've been misled. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Day the Earth is still classic. And one of the things I like in movies in general, horror movies and science fiction, <clears throat> social commentary. Uh, we're talking about social things. That movie is very much the message that the world needed at the time and the message the world needs to now. Uh, number three. Also, it had robots. Yeah, robots. Robots. And the uh, classic phrase, Klaatu Verata. Uh, number three is southland tales back to richard kelly i love southland tales a lot of people don't that movie touches me like i'm serious man and i'm not even trying to be like the divinals or anything but like (laughs) when i think about that movie i I almost want to touch myself in my soul that movie changed my life i'm not even lying number two 2001 a space odyssey all right what can you say that movie is long, but it doesn't feel long to me. It inspires me. It's the story of human evolution. If you don't understand the ending, just send me a Facebook message. I'll tell you. And uh, number one, Blade Runner. Blade Runner I, is an excellent film. I, I absolutely adore it. The the music in that movie is fantastic. Something that all these movies have very well is music. Uh, I love that. You know, so, the yeah. thing that struck me about Blade Runner was the uh, the models. Oh yeah, yeah. It looks That's not CG. Man. It you looks know? so amazing to yeah, be shot does. back then. Yeah, that 80. opening scene when they come up, everything looks like pyramids. Yeah, and, and there's just smoke. But that was a giant model, mm-hmm. and the actual fire coming out, and it's just wicked. Man. But yes. What about you, John? I'm interested. Uh, for my uh, look at the five. For my number five would be uh, would and this is I'm probably gonna get uh, chastised for this being my number five because it's not a classic. But it is a sequel to a classic that I, uh. I love, and that would be Tron Legacy. Ooh. I really enjoy Tron Legacy. Well, I haven't seen it. I it's one of those sci-fi it. films that I was worried. I don't think Tron. There are there. There's cult Tron fans, but Tron never had the the following that uh, Star Wars or something did. 
obviously didn't have multiple films. And Disney almost disowned the franchise, you know, the Tron. I mean, it just it wasn't what it was expected to be. It wasn't a big blockbuster. So to, to, for them to do another film, and they did, they did Tron Legacy. They did a great job. Visually, it's just amazing. And then Daft Punk does the soundtrack, which we'll get to how awesome the soundtrack that was. And then, uh, okay, number four, Time Bandits. Love me some Time Bandits. Big Terry Gilliam fan. Do you think I'd have another Terry Gilliam movie <laughs> on the list? And I don't. <laughs> 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 number three, Donnie Darko, which you also brought up. All right, Love yeah. Donnie Darko. Uh, I mean, what? Who, you know, everybody's seen Donnie Darko. I don't have yeah. to go into it. Uh, number two, Back to the Future. Believe it or not, Ooh, I just yeah. love me yeah. some Back to the Future. I know That's that there's nothing. Uh, I mean, you look at some of these films that have these big messages or whatever, and maybe this is more simple message, but I enjoyed. But the none film. of them have. Huey Lewis in the news. That's that's true. Exactly. You're just too damn loud. Remember he hollers at him. Too and damn loud. I love Huey Lewis. And my number one favorite of all time, again, Tron. Love Tron. There was something about Tron. I guess it was the first movie with extensive CG. There's. Uh, it was came out in 1982. It had over 15 minutes of CG in it, which is unheard for uh, of at the time. There just wasn't. There was very little CG used in films. And certainly not 15 minutes of CG. It's just it blew my mind as a child. Um, I remember running around in the yard and playing with frisbees. And st- I love Star Wars. I loved all those movies as a kid, but Tron, for some reason, stuck with me. The light cycles, going into a computer, <coughs> blew my mind. Still visually amazing day. Rent the Blu-ray if you can. They restored it. Beautiful job. Worth checking out. Love Jeff Bridges, so it kind of sells it. And uh, speaking of, s- well, I kind of went on a tangent there and talking about Daft Punk doing uh, Tron Legacy. Um, I, I thought the Tron Legacy soundtrack was amazing. They did a great job. Yeah, so Grammy I'm, winners of this year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Congratulations, Daft Punk. Yeah, mm-hmm. great band. Some would say the greatest group to come out of France. I can't think of any other groups come out of yeah, France. Yeah, me neither. So, that has, <laughs> so, uh, so speaking of which, um, uh, sci-fi soundtrack, sci-fi scores. A lot of it has to do with if the movie stays with you or how how the movie hits you is obviously a, a good score, or a good soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's some great songs you know added to this whatever. Uh, John Williams obviously did a lot of uh, yeah. Star Wars, Jurassic Park. I forgot he did E.T. He did all the movies. Oh, he did yeah. every Spielberg yeah, film. Yeah, he did every Spielberg film. He even did Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, he and did Schindler's a lot of non-sci-fi right? stuff. The uh, Okay, soundtracks. So is there a song, soundtrack, sticks with you, particular you like? Is there a particular? Just just feeling it out here. Uh, start with uh, let's start with Robbie this time. Yeah, like, I s- like I said earlier, Blade Runner. Uh, was it Vangelis or whatever that does the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. That... Dude, I just want to sit there and listen to that only. It's really good. Um, Southland Tales has Moby, and it's got a lot of cool oh, music yeah. in it. <clears throat> uh, Day the Earth Stood Still is probably mm. my favorite. The soundtrack to that is awesome. And the theremin. The theremin. You can, the most important instrument in sci-fi movie music is my the aunt theremin. Had, my aunt had theremin. She had to go to the doctors twice a week to <laughs> <get> removed. <laughs> Uh, I love the theremin. It's a really creepy sounding instrument. You know, back in the day, people thought it was the spirits of the dead talking to them, and they freaked out when people played it. It's very difficult to play. It's really fun. Well, yeah, because you don't actually get to see the thing you're playing with. Yeah, you're just waving your hands in the air. Okay, I get the confused yeah. with the round thing. That's the thing that you. Okay. You're talking about the glass bowls. Yeah, I'm thinking of the glass bowls. What I'm thinking uh, of. Yeah. <clears throat> if our listeners never heard it, they should go on YouTube, listen to it. Day the Earth is still original soundtrack. Yeah, a okay. lot of of horror films and sci-fi films use the theremin. And in case you don't know what we're talking about, oh, you mean band saws? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean the theremin sounds way cooler than me and Robbie making noises. You say that, but it sounds really close. Well, you guys, you guys could have done the soundtrack yourself. What would your soundtrack song sticks with you, James? <clears throat> well, one of my, uh, I would say, is the most fun soundtrack for me is uh, from Ghost of Mars. Of course, done by uh, Carpenter, but on this one, he also had Buckethead with him the whole time. So it's pretty crazy and like really fast paced and like keeps you moving the whole time. But it's a really fun soundtrack. And you, Justin, favorite. Song soundtrack. There, there are so many. I score <laughs> music to me. Like I, is not needed. More... Is that what you're gonna say? No. What an asshole. No. Music I find is is the way movie more to your enjoyable. ears. To... <laughs> <laughs> Some say that <laughs> movie to your ears. <laughs> music for me is better when it's associated with an experience or memory. So most of my favorite music is actually soundtrack uh, from my favorite films. Like all of the Star Wars films, you know, na 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 na. The next generation. I don't know. Theme. I don't remember that song. I don't know what song. All you're the saying. music from Star Wars, dun, 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 Jurassic Park, 
Sunshine, though. <laughs> That's why it's on it's my back list. On the sunshine. It all comes back to sunshine. The Surface of the Sun by John Murphy. <laughs> How heliocentric of you, my friend. Mm. So, so like, less is more with this music. And it, it's the way it builds and builds and builds to this big, epic climax, and then it just kind of fades away. Danny Boyle, director of that film. Yeah. Excellent at using music in his work. Yeah. Absolutely. Train spotting, slumdog millionaire. Excellent soundtrack. Also, 28 uh, Days Later. 28 days I don't later, think yeah. anybody's going to mention this one, but Inception. Inception. Great uh, film. Great modern sci-fi classic. Who and was, yes, uh, it's science fiction. Somebody mm. was arguing with me that earlier. No, it was not it was science fiction. In fact, yeah, Inception is science fiction, right? Oh, hell yeah. yeah. I'm excited for Interstellar. Um, and I talked earlier. I said uh, Tron, Tron Legacy. Wendy, Wendy Carlos, who did Tron, also did, I believe... Uh, Man, The Shining, perhaps? The tr- Wendy Carlos did a lot of, of horror and sci-fi films, um, but Tron specifically is the one I recall because it had that... It just fit the film. It had that electronic feel, even though it was a film in 1982. And then Daft Punk kept that. I mean, they definitely kept that one their own direction with it, but it's catchy, it's melodic, it fits the film. Daft Punk, it feels like Daft Punk, but it doesn't feel like they just like, you know, like, oh, we're going to make this song, we're just going to use it for the movie. Yeah. You know, it fits the film, it works well with the film, it was a great soundtrack. It blows my mind that Daft Punk's like, oh yeah, we're gonna, we haven't done an album in years, and we're just going to do this whole soundtrack for this film, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it boggles my mind. And then, of course, they got the new album, which is phenomenal as well. But uh, <laughs> Tron and Tron Legacy, just phenomenal. Not, of course, counting all the scores for all the great sci-fi films. Obviously, Star Wars sticks with me, specifically, yeah. but... Pretty much anything by John Williams is going to be universally recognizable. Speaking of which, <laughs> speaking of John Williams, Ridley Scott. <laughs> <laughs> we were uh, we were actually talking. I noticed that a lot of people brought up Blade Runner. A lot of people. Absolutely. If it's not in your top five. It's in your top ten. Everybody enjoys Blade Runner. Blade Runner is a great, great film. Or Alien, also Ridley Scott. Yep. Great film. Again, sci-fi horror film, which was one of the... I mean, that's one of the prior to Event Horizon, which is a sci-fi horror film. Mm. That was one of the first sci-fi horror films I saw. Aliens, obviously more of an action film. Great film, by the way, James Cameron. Mm. But uh, yeah, Ridley Scott, great director. I think nobody will ever talk shit about Ridley Scott. His brother was also a great director. Rest in peace. Tony Scott. Tony Scott. Mm. Did True Romance. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so Ridley Scott, uh, we can talk a little bit about Ridley Scott here for a second for you guys people. Some people out there listening may know a lot about Ridley Scott. I learned some stuff. Uh, recently about Ridley Scott because I uh, looked him up. What did you learn? I learned he is a ninja. No, that's not true. <laughs> I actually, I learned... Uh, okay, he's he's British. He's born in the UK. Um, he wanted When he was younger, he wanted to join the military because his brother was already in the military. But his dad didn't want him to. He wanted him to instead pursue the arts. So he ended up going to uh, the London's Royal College of Art where he learned... Uh, I'm sorry, where he helped found the film department. Yeah, and then he after that he joined. And when you graduate, he joined the BBC in 1962 as a trainee set designer, working on several shows, high profile shows, mind you. He attended a trainee des, uh, <coughs> director's uh, course, and then after he learned that he took the directing course, he did an episode of the prestigious BBC series Z Cars. I actually don't re- I don't recall this show. Does anybody know Z Cars? Uh, it w- I, what I remember about it was it, it, ha- it was filled with a lot of prestige. Okay, he also uh. worked on... It, I don't think he directed, but he also at one point in time worked on Doctor Who when he was over there. Huh. Ooh, yeah, at the BBC. Yeah. Now you've uh, piqued our interest. I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was the one that created that... No, he didn't. He, <laughs> I think he was maybe a set design. He had a smaller bit, I, to my knowledge, from Doctor Who. So well, set he, design on Doctor Who would be Yeah, it was big. still cool to be a part of it, regardless of where. But he eventually left the BBC, BBC because it, it paid, well, diddly squat. He was frustrated by the pay. Him and his brother founded uh, Ridley Scott Associates, which is a uh, company making advertising company to make commercials. Basically, he uh, he began working with uh, David Putman in the seventies, uh, developing ideas for feature films. So this commercials led back into you know TV. Now doing commercials. Now back into films. And David Putman, uh, the first venture was The Duelist in nineteen seventy seven, which won the jury prize for first best first work at Cannes in nineteen seventy seven. Was nominated for the was it the Palme d'Or? Can someone help me with that? Yeah, okay. That's correct. More than uh, That kind of launched his film career. And then with the success of uh, Star Wars and New Hope, he was inspired to do a sci-fi. And, uh, of course, he worked on Doctor Who, like I said. So uh, Dan, Dan O'Bannon was working on this, or had this 
uh, he wrote this low budget sci fi horror film, and Ridley agreed to direct, and that was of course Alien. And it changed the yeah, world. A critical, yeah, it was a, it was a critical and commercial success. Uh, after he did his commercial work, he came back to sci-fi again and did Blade Runner. Mm. A classic of the genre. The yeah. genre. Which was based on uh, Philip K. Dick's Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep. Mm. What are your opinions on Ridley Scott? Anybody uh, want to talk about Ridley Scott or Ridley Scott's films? I said I almost said <laughs> Ridley's cock, but that's not. That's something. Oh. That's a whole other episode. That's for the Smiler Harsh show. <laughs> <laughs> Ridley Scott is one of the best directors of all time, though, just because he is involved. Like the the movie is supposed to be seen as the director's final vision of the the screenplay and everything put together. He's one of the directors that actually takes part in most of the process. Like he'll he does writing, producing, editing. He does a lot of it. He runs the craft table. Yeah, like when when I first watched Blade Runner, I watched. The <laughs> You just agree with me? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> He's got to get the pizzas. <laughs> when I first watched Blade Runner, I watched the 1992 director's cut, international. I think it was international director's cut or something like that, whatever. Because I figured, you know, that would be the that'd be the one to watch because you know it would been quote unquote remastered at the time. Yeah. Was that the one the not to watch in retrospect? No. Uh, okay. The original actually was the one not to watch. Oddly enough. <clears throat> Ridley Scott's one of my favorite directors, period. Like, I really like his work. And it goes even beyond sci-fi. I mean, he did Gladiator. He did Kingdom oh, yeah. of Heaven, which I love Kingdom of Heaven. American Gangster's pretty good. Black Hawk Down, Black Hawk Down. is yeah. amazing. Thelma and Louise, G.I. Jane, those are solid movies. Legend, dude. Speaking of Tom Cruise, right? Hmm. Legend. Uh, and don't ever forget about Prometheus. Prometheus, I really enjoyed Prometheus. Did you watch that on yeah. Blu-ray? <laughs> I watched it on DVD because <laughs> John loaned me the Blu-ray and the Blu-ray missing. wasn't in there. I so in watched it on DVD. Oh. But yeah, I, I really like him. I, it's his background in uh, set design as a production designer that he has such care over every single bit of everything that's going to be on camera. Right. And it's all like purposefully put there by Ridley Scott. Like everything you see in any frame of his movie, he knew it was there. Yeah, he's definitely a master of the mise-en-scene. What exactly? <laughs> <laughs> but I adore Ridley Scott, and every time he does a new film, he's done some stuff I, I don't really like that much. Body of Lies, you know, Finding Nemo. <laughs> I don't know about that I one. I don't think that was him. <laughs> Ridley Scott supposedly is working on a sequel to Prometheus. That's he, gonna be a after, really tight. After rope his to walk. current pro film, he's working on a Blade Runner sequel. Yeah, oh, he's working that. on a current yeah, project, then he's doing a Blade Runner sequel, then he's doing another Prometheus film. Hmm. Yeah, Eden or something like that. I think it's called. James, your uh, how do you feel about Ridley Scott? Your opinion of Ridley Scott? I think that he is um, he's an excellent director and a, a very good case study for how a director should work. Um, like I was joking before, he is a master of the mise en scene, which is just you know everything that's in the scene. So like every piece that you see, he has thought about it and he's put it there for a reason. So I mean, he's good. It's like a house designer with feng shui. Exactly. I can't really add to that. I agree with you guys. Great director, great films. His attention to details, what sets his films apart. Love him. Look forward to his next film, especially a new uh, Alien movie, a new uh, Blade Runner. We're going to take a little break. Uh, with music by Jonathan Strickland. Hope City. We'll be right back. To the left, to the right, come on, come on 
hands up in the sky, wave them side to side, in the front to the back, come on, come on, feel it in the song, it's the beat that makes you nod, to the left, to the right, come on, come on, hands up in the sky, wave them side to side, in the front to the back, come on, come on, feel it in the song, it's the beat that makes you nod. That's the way the cookie crumbles, yeah, I'm on my killer croc game, counting all was lost, that's a game, think what you overcame, Savage Wolverine, you won't hear me when I'm coming, all these rappers try to flex, I'm just barely starting to strut, strut, find a very comical, we find relief in Chronicle, kick it with my team, we go higher than impossible, don't put me in a box, cause I'm breaking all the obstacles, hopes and all my rhymes, is to make me feel unstoppable, well, yes and no, I'd be lying if I said this was the easy road, running with a pack of rogues, all in Jesus name, if you're all about the fame, no, we are not the same, cause my life is hidden, go ahead and bring the rain, it's in our deepest struggles that we learn to fight the pain, yeah, you feel me? To the left, to the right, come on, come on, hands up in the sky, wave them side to side, in the front, to the back, come on, come on. Feeling in the song, it's the beat that makes you nod to the left, to the right, come on, come on. Hands up in the sky, wave side to side, in the front, to the back, come on, come on. Feeling in the song, it's the beat that makes you nod to the left, to the right, come on, come on. Hands up in the sky, wave side to side, in the front, to the back, come on, come on. Feeling in the song, it's the beat that makes you nod. Welcome back to the Smile or Else show here in the Huntsville Attic. That was Jonathan Strickland, Hope City. Go ahead and get on the uh, internet. Check that out. Yeah, yeah. it's really good I agree. You, you should kids, check it out. You kids with the internet. Uh, awesome, though. Awesome song. Uh, so we were talking about our favorite sci-fi films, and uh, we're talking about Ridley Scott. And we're supposed to be talking about Blade Runner, which everybody loves Blade Runner. I don't think I met a person that didn't like Blade Runner, and if I have, I've just owned those people. And, of course, Blade Runner, as, as I said, was based on Phil K. Dick's do android do androids dream of electric do sheep? Do android dream, dream of, of electric, electric sheep? sheep. Sheeps this is. In Soviet Russia. So that was uh, <laughs> that was Philip K. Dick. There was actually a lot of sci-fi films based, based on his works. He did a lot of short stories, a lot of novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, Philip K. Dick, if you're not familiar with him, he was uh, an American novelist, short story writer, and essayist who published uh, work in... Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much all science fiction. Majority, I'd say 99% of his stuff. Uh, he explored sociological, political, and metaphysical themes in novels, dominated by monopolist. Mon- <laughs> monopolistic is not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was. Okay. It can be now. You're the host, <laughs> goddamn. Welcome back to the Smiler. The monopolistic show. hour with uh, monopolistic corporations, authoritarian governments, and altered states. In later works, Dick's thematic focus strongly reflected his personal interest. And metaphysics and theology. He often drew upon his own life experiences in addressing the nature of drug abuse, paranoia, schizophrenia, and transcendental experiences. He was a little... He had some troubles mentally. He, he, he was very paranoid. He was very parano- paranoid. And it, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely obviously in his work. You, sometimes I think you, there are writers or musicians or artists where... You're like, oh, this guy must have been crazy, or this guy was dark, or this guy was... No, no, that's just uh, that's just their style. In this case, he was paranoid as shit. Yeah. yeah. He thought people were walk- watching him, stealing his work, and a lot of the stuff that he, he did, a lot a lot of it's kind of mm-hmm. almost come true, you know? So oh, yeah, he definitely predicted Slightly things. prophetic. Yeah. He, he believed yeah. he was a, prof- a, a, a sci- science fiction prophet, if you will, like, no doubt. Hmm. He, uh, he published 44 novels... Wrote 121 short stories, which more, many of which became films. He spent most of his career in near poverty, though, even though 11 uh, popular films are based on his works, which include Blade Runner, which we talked about, Total Recall, yep. A Scanner Darkly, <clears throat> Minority Report, Paycheck, Next, Screamers, and The Adjustment Bureau. Yeah. Oh, and Imposter. Imposter with Gary Sinise, yeah. So that was a, hmm. that's a lot of films. I actually, we actually talked about doing a Philip K. Dick episode. Um, and it didn't evolve, so it's nice to bring him up because he's he's a great writer, and there's been some great films. So I recently watched uh, in anticipation. I, mo- I watched most of these films already, but I ended up watching Screamers, 
with uh, Peter Weller. I still haven't seen that one. With the it's great Peter Weller. The, the great, great Peter, Peter Weller. Weller. It's nice the real movie. RoboCop for you kids listening. <clears throat> yes. And if Batman, you see another RoboCop on TV or in the movies, that's not the real he RoboCop. He was Batman in Dark Knight Returns. He was. Yeah. He's in Star Trek. Yeah. Enterprise yeah. and the remake. Speaking of authors, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, is there somebody you guys want to talk about? Somebody in mind? Do you have a favorite sci-fi author, favorite sci-fi book? That you think, hey, this would be a great film. Why isn't this being made into a film? Is there somebody you want to talk about, James? Um, I'd like to talk about Richard Matheson. The he excellent. Wrote, oh, yeah, the he, old guy from Grumpy Old Man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, he he wrote a lot for uh, Twilight Zone, um, and he also wrote I Am Legend, which has been made into what like four movies now. Three, I can think of. Well, I Last, think there are some really B-rate might ones. Be. That They're the Omega Man. With Charlton yeah. Heston, Vincent mm-hmm. Price, the last man on earth. Yep. Um, and so the Will Smith classic. Classic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sequel to Wild Wild West, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But um, yeah, he's one of the greats, and he, you know, actually wrote scripts for stuff, you know, not just the books. And then he worked in more phases than one. A lot of these sci-fi authors didn't I mean, make a lot of TV work, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of them had to do a lot of everything. Because, I mean, sci-fi was not a very high-income writing position. I mean, you got p- placed in books that were, you know, paperback, weekly release books. I mean, they were very disposable stories most of the time. What, do you have a author in mind or author you want to talk about? Or I, I, I was um, under the impression that you couldn't read, Justin Goldsmith. I, did when I that was is younger. a rumor. I did when I was younger. I think I forgot how. Of course, I wrote that rumor down so you couldn't read it. Uh, oh, <laughs> you couldn't the only, refute the only you couldn't book, read it. The only book series I've ever finished reading is called Virtual War, and it's by Gloria Skrzynski. It's actually a really cool sci-fi story. It's kind of like The Hunger Games, except better, and it came out before The Hunger Games. So you guys should read that. Who's the hipster now? Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. There's not a movie of that one, my friend. I know. It actually kind of bothered me after I saw The Hunger Games. Robbie, is there an author uh, you want to talk about or an author or a book well, in particular? I really like Michael Crichton. Hmm. Not going to lie. I know it's a little bit more modern. It's not hmm. your Isaac Asimov. It's not your uh, Arthur C. Clarke. You know? But, uh, <laughs> no, I, I really like Michael Crichton's work. He, of course, did Jurassic Park. Yeah. He did The Andromeda Strain. Congo. Yeah, Congo, which <laughs> Congo's Congo. a good book, Amy. man. Yeah, good gorilla. Uh, my favorite book of his and one of the most terrible sci-fi movies, I think, is Sphere. I absolutely love the novel Sphere. Uh, also, going into the comic books, Grant Morrison and Warren Ellis. The Invisibles by Grant Morrison and Planetary by Warren Ellis. Those two guys, some of the best science fiction writers. And as of late... Jonathan Hickman. Well, and also don't forget uh, Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman. Neil a lot Gaiman. of fantasy, not so much sci-fi. But Wait, who writes the Manhattan Projects? Uh, Jonathan Hickman. That is Hickman. Yeah. Manhattan yeah. Projects Hickman. is phenomenal. <clears throat> yes. I'm not. I I do love sci-fi films. Like I said, I don't watch a lot of sci-fi shows, but I do like sci-fi films. And I didn't. I didn't really. I don't know. As much as I read comics, I don't get into sci-fi comics for some reason. And I just love Manhattan Projects. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. If you, if you haven't checked it out, pick it up. Paperbacks are out if you want to get into it that way. Uh, what's, what book are they into now, comic? Three volumes out right now in so, paperback. And a lot more work of his that's really good. East to West, Transhuman, Red Mask from Mars, Nightly News. Lots of good stuff. And I think there's a there if you're if you live in the Huntsville area, I Pax think there's a comic Romana book. Pax Romana is his best work. My bad. Pax Romana, his Pax best Romana. work. Pax Romana. Romana? <laughs> Romana. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, The Deep, right here in town. If you're in the Huntsville area and you're a Huntsville listener, definitely swim by The Deep. They will have great books, and they can help you uh, find some great sci-fi comic books, uh, sci-fi graphic novels. Again, I, I can't think of anything specific. I read a bunch of books, but the one that stuck with me the most is, is that I would consider sci-fi was Ray Bradbury, which was uh, Fahrenheit 451. Mm. Love that book. Love okay. that book. I think a lot of my favorite books are just aren't sci-fi. It's not like I haven't read sci-fi books. It's just that a lot of them just aren't sci-fi. It's my, it my favorite. But that one, for some reason, love that book. Of course, I say I think that's required reading for everybody. If you haven't read that, read. I mean, it should be in I've your actually list never of read books. it. Justin, escort Robbie out. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about sci-fi shows. I'm, I'm the adamant that, that – adamant. That's probably not the correct verb. Adamant? <laughs> adamant? Yeah, yeah, adamant. Adamant. Uh, 
there are some sci-fi I like, but I'm not a hardcore sci-fi show guy. I watch more sci-fi movies, but I've never really got into Star Trek or Quantum Leap or any of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, I'm not. I mean, there are some shows I definitely enjoy, but I like your guys' take. See what you do. I know that Justin, for example, is a big Star Trek guy. He's been trying to get me into it, but I've been resisting. Uh, it's been hard. <laughs> yeah, I watch TV series like people read books, so that's my thing. Start. I think most people read, watch TV series like most people <laughs> used to read books. Yeah. yeah. What's the one you've been watching recently that you're trying to get into that has Scott Bakula? What series is that? Quantum Leap. No, no, no. no the Enterprise. Star Trek series. Enterprise. Is that the one with the terrible opening theme song? Now, see, I, I that love Star is what Trek, ruined I, that show. <laughs> is that song? Yeah. Because when you're that. watching it on TV, <laughs> you're like, the, what am I going to do here? I like the video, but I agree. I don't think it should have been the opening credits. That's why. The show. That's like, why the best episodes of that are the. Uh, the mirror, <laughs> yeah, the mirror ones, universe. Because yeah. they switch the yeah. thing and it, it goes back to like just a orchestral thing, and everything's red because it's all about the empire. Is the last I, episode him him the last Star Trek episode him leaping into another body and it was just all a? <laughs> I thought I was waiting for him the whole series to make reference to it, but it didn't. They the last episode actually is the last episode of Enterprise is actually a Next Generation episode. <laughs> it's Riker and yeah. Troy in the holodeck talking about them. Yeah. Is the worst episode ever. It's a terrible way to end the series. But it got canceled, so they had to wrap everything up pretty fast. Quickly. Yeah. Could that be your, characters randomly. Would that be your favorite really show then? Off. Was that I mean, what was your favorite? Was it the Star Trek series or you not know, pick one or what was your what was the uh, show that The first three seasons of Sliders is some of the best sci fi that's ever been. Also, was delicious. I love White Castle and their little sliders. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they made a, se- a, a show about those little burgers. The, uh, Going through. I could uh, watch it, but it made me hungry, I would think. <laughs> but yeah, it was a very good parallel. Didn't dimension. they have the fat kid from Stand By Me? <laughs> yeah, Jerry O'Connell. <laughs> did any of you ever watch Lost in Space, the TV I show? Did. Slightly. Slightly. But I mean, that doctor, man. The creepy doctor. That shit creepy. gets old after two episodes. His whining. They, his character, it, he evolved the most out of all the. He was the only thing really that evolved on the show because I was reading about this recently. He uh, was supposed to be just straight up evil at the beginning, but then they, he twerked the character. He twerked. <laughs> he twerked. <laughs> wow. That's where that came from. He tweaked the character. <laughs> I don't think that. And uh, whoever the director, Irwin Allen. I think Irwin Allen, the guy I think that created it was the Ethan show. Allen. Ethan Allen. Irwin, <laughs> I, think so. Irwin, I think it's Irwin Ethan Allen. Ethan Hawke. Uh, was, was talking to him about it, and he liked what he was doing with the character, so he was like, yeah, do that. And then it evolved, and his his character changed a lot over the course of that show. And it, it was... I don't think Star Trek would have been as big as it got if Lost in Space hadn't come out before it. That robot from that show couldn't be any more what people thought robots look like today. Well, yeah. It's and the they exact same robot from a movie. <laughs> Is it the, Forbidden Planet, right? Yeah. yeah. It's the same it's robot. Exact, oh, it's the same, same robot. robot. Forbidden, okay. So that's also what all toy robots looked like. Yeah, after that. Wasn't that, that robot like everything. named Robbie? I believe so. <laughs> was that the Nintendo robot, too? Was Robbie the robot? Robbie the robot is a terrible name for a robot. <laughs> I'm actually the robot. You know that? We have to wind up Robbie every episode. And that was yeah. a sexual metaphor, actually. Gonna wind me <laughs> up, like a Gwen Stefani song. <laughs> what, what, what show? Is there a specific show you want to talk about, Robbie? That you like, you enjoy? Well, lately, I just want to mention this. I've been watching X Files, mm. and X Files is a little too case of the week for me sometimes at the beginning. But overall, I enjoyed X Files a lot as a kid, and I liked Aliens and the Paranormal, and so it was a really cool show. You'll you'll start getting into the mythology episodes too, where they have the main. Yes. Huge story arc. That's good stuff. And be sure to watch the movie, uh, Fight the Future. It, it, to me, the X-Files could have ended after Fight the Future. Yeah. It could have been done. I love Star Trek. <laughs> Absolutely adore Star Trek. Just period. Like, Star Trek is one of my favorite science fiction shows. I think it's the most influential science fiction television show ever. And Justin's got a little ring on his pinky. He's got a pinky ring of the Federation. <laughs> Yeah, Starfleet Academy. Mm. The old pinky Federation ring. <laughs> I, I absolutely adore, especially Next Generation and mm. Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine yeah. is definitely, I think, the best overall. That's because a sci-fi it has, western. Yeah, oh, yeah, and it has the best <clears throat> overarching story. It continues yeah. through the whole thing. It's really good. 
Uh, props out to Firefly, of course, because that's a great show. My favorite sci-fi show, though, when I've had to think about it really hard, might be Lost. Ooh. Might be Lost. I know a lot of people... I don't know if that's really sci-fi. It's, it's a very... It's, it's got sci-fi. It's a very yeah. sci-fi show. Yeah, it's, it's, sci. it's got time travel. It's got genetic research. Shitty it's writing. Com- oh, burn. All right, then How fuck it. it. I'm going to say Lost. <laughs> lost. <laughs> It's a documentary, John. How can it have bad Lost. writing? It feels like they're writing as they went, because they were doing. That's, That's how all. writers write. I'm sorry. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> okay. Lost. I like Lost. Okay. The Star Trek stuff. Lost. Firefly. There you go. James. Um, I'll go ahead and give you five here, really quick. Uh, Battlestar Galactica, the the original or the no, new? yeah the newer season seasons of that. Mm-hmm. That uh, I think was a groundbreaking on like doing a far more realistic science fiction show. Is that the one with Edward James almost? Yes. Is it almost? Yep. Almost? Almost. <laughs> almost? Whatever it is. Almost. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it does a really good job of really making you feel immersed in this is all possible. And it gives you great uh, curse words you can say in public. Like frack. <laughs> <laughs> Other shows I have on my list. Doctor Who. Got to mention Doctor Who. We did an audience poll of TV shows. The two that kept popping up, Firefly and more than anybody else, Doctor mm-hmm. Who. Great show. Yeah, and I'm... I'm not sure if that's science fiction, though, James. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so... Um, but yeah, and I am just recently started going through the old, old stuff. Still black and white. And uh, second Doctor so far. Excellent. But uh, Farscape, mm. Orphan Black, a new one. It's really good. It's about uh, cloning. And then uh, I- any one of the uh, Stargate shows. Mm-hmm. Did that have MacGyver in it? Yes, it did. Is that his real name? He could do anything. No, he's MacGyver. <laughs> MacGyver Dean mm. Anderson. Who knew that a popular show would come with come from a, a movie that I liked as a kid? You look back at now and it was pretty <laughs> mediocre. But it spawned a pretty successful TV show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For being a, I mean, it was one of those movies where they're like, we'll just use the darkness to hide up, hide the special effects because we, I don't know if it was a budget. There was a lot of darkness to kind of cover that up. It's a lot of darkness. And you notice that in all earlier sci-fi and horror films. Yeah. Um, when they broke, I think Jonathan, was it John Landis who broke that rule was like, fuck it, let's just show everything. And this is horror films specifically. He was talking about American Werewolf yes. in London. Yeah. They're like, we're just going to show in the <clears> thing as well. Um, they just broke That's that. That's a great rule. sci-fi movie, right there, guys. The thing, the thing yeah. yeah, yeah. The thing is a classic, and I actually really enjoyed the thing. The the prequel, prequel? yeah. yeah. It really was not marketed good. as a prequel, but a phenomenal. That's yeah. really. I was delightfully surprised by that. Yeah, you at the very end, you see like the beginning of the original yeah, movie. Dude. Yeah, it sets it all up. Go home and fire yeah. it up, man, and watch it. I was gonna bring up. I I wasn't a big uh, sci-fi show guy. Um, if we can talk about anime a little bit, I would talk about Cowboy Bebop. I love Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy and Bebop. And okay. if we're going to talk about That's animated <laughs> in general, love me some Futurama. It's a comedy, obviously, but obviously yeah. set in sci-fi. And you know what I forgot mm-hmm. about until until we were talking? One of my favorite shows, and short-lived, one of my favorite actors, somebody we, we've met, uh, Briscoe County Jr. It's actually yeah. sci-fi Western. It does yeah. have sci-fi elements. Um, it starts off that with traditional sphere. Western, and we did takes meet off. Bruce Campbell. That yeah, was and he that was, was a very fun. awesome guy. Yeah, we he talked him. shit to us. Yeah, he did talk shit to us. We're gonna take a quick break. Stay tuned for the science minutes. Watch Farscape, and watch Farscape. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't actually get to talk about Farscape. <laughs> it was limited to just. Mm. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and this is your Science Minute. In Portugal, paleontologists have uncovered the bones of what could very well be the largest terrestrial predator of the Jurassic era. The Torvosaurus had four-inch teeth, weighed four to five tons, and probably reached over 32 feet in length. Speaking of tall drinks of water, here's John Holshue. Thanks, Robbie. 
Doctors revealed on Wednesday at a conference in Boston that a baby was in remission from the AIDS virus. The girl was born in suburban Los Angeles last April, a month after researchers announced the first case of a possible cure, a baby from Mississippi. The Mississippi case was a medical first that led doctors worldwide to rethink how fast and how hard to treat infants born with HIV, and the California doctors followed that example. The baby was cured by administering treatment within hours after birth. Robbie? Thank you, John. Europa, the icy moon of Jupiter with its molten core and immense ocean, represents the best possible candidate for other life in our solar system. Early steps to investigate this possibility have begun. NASA's 2015 budget request from the Obama administration includes money for the pre-formulation of a mission to send a probe to the mysterious moon. It's very early, but definitely a step in the right direction. Every day old pizza? What about three-year-old pizza? Well, thanks to a few tweaks to the basic recipe, the U.S. Army has created a pizza that doesn't spoil anywhere nearly as fast as fresh pizza. U.S. servicemen and women have to survive on what is known as ready-to-eat meals when in the field, especially in areas without kitchens and without supplies. Pizza has long been a request for many who survive on the ready-to-eat meals, and it looks like the U.S. Army's Natick Soldier Research Development Engineering Center has solved the problem. It's taken two years to find an ingredient that will trap moisture, keeping the dough fresh without spoiling the food. It should keep for at least three years and even survive in 80-degree heat until consumed. Mmm, delicious. Robbie? Speaking of steps in the right direction, I'm Robbie. That was John. Back to John and Robbie on the Smile or Else show. This was a science minute or, or two. And we're back. We were talking about sci-fi shows, sci-fi films, sci-fi books, sci-fi, sci-fi everything. We've been on a sci-fi kick. Everything but the sci-fi channel, which again, we don't even know what it's called. It's Skiffy or Sci-Fi or Sufufu. Mm. I don't know. They changed the Y on the end to yeah. an I. It's, it's the first half of a, vener- of a venereal disease now. Justin would know Sif- firsthand, of course. <laughs> so we already talked about what... Uh, makes great sci-fi. I'd like to talk about what makes sci-fi great. Those are two different Ooh. two different topics. And I'm going to start with uh, this time I'm going to start with Robbie. To you, Robbie, what makes sci-fi <coughs> great to you? Not to anybody else, to you. I don't care what Justin thinks. Fuck Justin. Until we get to Justin. <laughs> Possibilities. <laughs> I'm okay. No. Uh. <laughs> it speaks on the human condition. It we reflect our modern society, and we even project that into the future in some cases. We take where we are, and we ask a simple question. Where are we going? And I love science fiction more than a lot of other genres because it always asks the question, where are we going? Just so happens a lot of sci-fi is futuristic. Some of it's set present day. But it's always of a mindset of where are we going? We take our current technology. We take our current ideas. We take our current I- I- everything. And we project it into the future. And we explore the bad things that could happen or the good things. You know, We either have a, a terrible future or we have a bright, shiny future. And we, we can explore as humans, as a society, what the best routes are how to use our technology and not become slaves to it, how to make a brighter future but not just decaying our society. So to me, I love science fiction because of that. Where are we going? It's about progress, whether it's showing us a warning or showing us a hope. Right. That's some deep shit. I w- I'm sobering up now with that, with that whole thing. James? Thank you. <laughs> what makes sci-fi great to you? <clears throat> It's the, the ability to get lost in it, but at the same time to get that deeper meaning. Have you ever seen that show Lost? I think that's sci-fi. I'm sorry. You go. <laughs> James, <laughs> what, makes, <laughs> what makes sci-fi great to you? <laughs> I apologize. Well, the thing that makes sci- sci-fi great is be- the ability to get completely immersed and lost in the stories that you're being told. And... Um, and while you're doing that, you think you're just having fun. You also learn. You learn about things that could possibly happen. You learn about 
Yourself. Agreed. Can't argue with that. Goldsmith. <laughs> Possibility. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Robbie, Robbie pretty much said the exact same thing I was going to say. Uh, possibilities and hope for, about the future. Because most, most sci-fi is set in the future. And I'm always going to come back to Star Trek as my prime example. It's an idealized version of the future. Uh, Even with all the war? There's war in it. But the humanity uh, comes together when, you know, when Zephram Cochran makes his first warp flight and the Vulcans, the, there's a Vulcan ship going by and they yeah. see it and they come down and make first contact because humans have been able to travel faster than the speed of light. Great movie. Which is a giant, a quantum leap forward <laughs> <laughs> in a human evolution, not just technology. Um, and that caught that really brought humanity together uh, after that. And, you know, realizing that we're not the only people here. And we don't know that yet. I mean, some people will say they do, but they don't know that they're aliens. The uh, I agree with you guys. Uh, you made some valid points. I was just say it's a good escape. I love sci-fi show. Mm. I, I do love the shows, but I don't watch Star Trek. I'm not adamant about certain shows, and maybe I just need to give them a chance. Maybe I would get absorbed, and I would, you know, watch the whole season just... Deep that whole net, the Netflix effect, I call it, where you just watch the whole thing, yeah. just get absorbed, and you watch the whole thing. So I agree with you guys. Um, same thing, I guess, we should be, could be said about sci-fi books, sci-fi, not just movies, sci-fi books, sci-fi <laughs> comic books, sci-fi, I don't know, sci-fi science paintings. Science fiction. <laughs> yeah, science yeah. fiction in general. So I appreciate you all for being here today, and there's definitely, I think I took away that uh, there are a lot of people that share the same sci-fi interest i do the same movies the same comics books etc and some stuff to definitely check out you know as much as i've shot down your star trek show with the shitty opening song <laughs> i do want to watch it and check it out because maybe something i get addicted to and i'll just fast forward that shitty song so i appreciate everybody for being here james justin <laughs> i forgot your name justin <laughs> robbie thank you for having me and i'm of course i'm your host with the cough <laughs> I'm your host, John Holshue. Please tune in uh, next week's episode, or next month, should I say. But we'll have, uh, you've heard of the Dog Whisperer. This guy, uh, Earl Hickman, he's the Iguana Whisperer. He'll be on the show. Uh, Timothy Dude, Dalton we, will we be here. we booked him? Timothy Dalton will be here and talk about what, of course, we all want to talk about if we met Timothy Dalton. He'll be talking about how to make a good figgy pudding. That's <laughs> what he'll be talking about. So those will be the next episode if you guys tune in. Or maybe there'll be something else all together. Perhaps we'll talk about villains. I don't know. We'll just play it by ear if Timothy Dalton's here or not. I would love to know what Timothy Dalton's favorite villains are. And again, how to make a good figgy pudding. Yes. Mm. So we appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Live long and prosper. Yes, and that whole Star Trek shit. That was supposed to be the end, John. <laughs> so say we all. <laughs>